Hey, this is Mike C. of The Natural Man Podcast. I gotta get this out of the way right off the top. The Natural Man Podcast is intended as general information for educational purposes only and should not be constituted as medical advice or diagnosis of any kind or as a substitute for medical treatment. The information provided in this podcast is not meant to replace the advice of or treatment by any physician. Do not rely upon any information to replace consultations or advice received by qualified health professionals regarding your own specific situation. If you suspect that you have a medical problem, you are urged to seek competent medical help. The Natural Man Podcast and its representatives and agents disclaim any liability for any negative or other medical or other outcomes that may occur as a result of acting on or not acting on any information contained in the podcast. The views and opinions expressed by the host and all guests are their own, and their appearance on this podcast and at the website of The Natural Man Podcast does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent, and does not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of the Natural Man Podcast. That's it. Here we go. This is the Natural Man Podcast with Mike C. Welcome to the Natural Man Podcast. My name is Mike C. Thanks for joining us for this episode. Uh, This is a podcast that looks at health, wellness, and discovering new ways to improve one's vitality. And we do that through exploring uh, breakthrough medicine, uh, people in the holistic field, um, basically anything that can help somebody live well. And today we have a guest who's a specialist in his field. And, uh, you know, his peers speak very highly of him. And uh, after my past conversations with him, I can see why. He's board certified in cardiac electrophysiology and cardiovascular diseases. Uh, He works currently in the world-renowned Mayo Clinic in Scottsdale, Arizona, in the cardiovascular department, Dr. Commander Srivatsan. Dr. Srivatsan, thanks for joining us for this episode of the Natural Man Podcast. Thank you for inviting me. Glad to be here. Uh, now, you're a, a noted cardiologist at Mayo Clinic, and you're an electrophysiologist, which is a specialty within cardiovascular medicine. Um, tell our viewers and listeners what that is exactly. Yes, ca- cardiology basically deals with the heart, which for practical purposes is a mechanical pump. But almost all mechanical pump requires some form of electricity. And the electrical impulses normally for your muscle, for example, in your arm or in your legs, the instructions come from the brain. But you can't be telling your heart, beat now, beat now, and so on. So what they have done is create a substation of a brain-like electrical network within the heart. And that is commonly known as the electrical conduction system of the heart. It's a substation of the brain, essentially. It has intrinsic automaticity, which means it has an ability to beat at 60 beats when you're resting. Activity will increase it because it has accelerators built into it, like adrenaline and so on. And when you're sleeping, it goes down to 45, 50, which is very common for good athletic individuals to go down even to the 40s when they're sleeping. So this electrical network is what is making the mechanical pump work. And when that goes wry, you have all kinds of irregular rhythms, and that's the usual situation when we are involved. Okay, and you treat cardiac arrhythmias primarily, um, working in that that field. And so complex cardiac ablations are one of your specialties. Can you tell me a little bit about that procedure and and some of the science behind it? Yes, so majority of the arrhythmias are due to abnormal cellular increased electrical activity. So this normal electrical system is confined to an upper portion of the right chamber called sinus node, and the electricity goes through a junction box in between called the atrioventricular node. Now, why do we need a junction box? Is because atrium is about one-tenth the size of the ventricle. So if you mechanically imagine a tiny 
person pulling a massive truck. It's you need some help. And that's what the junction box provides. It gives oil. It makes the thing skid uh, easily, which basically in electrical parlance reduces the resistance for the flow of electricity. And that in turn is able to stimulate a much bigger chamber, the ventricle. So that is how the normal electricity, the upper chamber beats, fills up the bottom chamber. The valves are closed. The bottom chamber exit chamber valve opens and it uh, contracts to push the blood out. Now, what if these normal cells are beating, but there is one abnormal cell, either because of aging, degeneration, drugs, alcohol excess, caffeine excess, or cocaine or something that has triggered it, you're now firing faster than the sinus node. Then that area will keep quiet. Now, if it occurs in the upper chamber, it is called premature atrial contraction. The same thing occurring in the bottom chamber is premature ventricular contraction. And sometimes they can be in two or three beats. When it is three or more beats, we call them tachycardia, especially if they're greater than 100 beats a minute. And if they're sustained, they can be atrial tachycardia or ventricular tachycardia. And if they're very chaotic, it's called atrial fibrillation or ventricular fibrillation. Ventricular fibrillation in otherwise is cardiac arrest. So now our goal is to go and spot this abnormally behaving cell and basically destroy it. Now, how do we, first, how do we spot? And then secondly, how do we destroy? These are two separate mechanisms. That's why it's called an electrophysiology study where we analyze where the abnormal cells are. Then the uh, basically incineration or ablation is a way of getting rid of the cell. So now to spot the mechanism, if the arrhythmia is spontaneously occurring as the patient is on the table, then we use multi, an electrode with, uh, with a catheter with multiple electrodes, which actually records these small, tiny signals are amplified on a computer screen. And now it takes a fixed signal from one portion of the heart and relatively correlates the location of the signals recorded in multiple portions of the heart and finds where is the earliest signal basically coming from. In, if you use, say, 3,000 points, the uh, correlation to the site of origin is phenomenally good. Within a one to two millimeter radius, you can nail the spark. Now, once you know this is the source content of the arrhythmia, then you move your mapping or roving catheter into that location. Now, you have several different ways you can destroy the tissue. Now, your destruction has to be pinpoint. I mean, you don't want to destroy willy-nilly a large area of the heart and the heart becomes too stiff overall and the patient doesn't do well. So these destructions are very minuscule and microscope. I mean, it is visible to the naked eye, but in proportion to the entire heart tissue, we're talking of less than 1%, I mean, 0.2%, 0.1% range. And the radio frequency is nothing but alteration of your general electricity that comes at home, which comes at 60 hertz. You would have heard of that as because if you go to Hoover Dam, you'll see 60 magnets spinning. Now, if the same electricity, you, if I pass normal electricity through someone to generate heat into the heart muscle, the heart muscle will fibrillate and the person will die. So what we are doing is we're increasing the frequency to 180,000 to 250,000, which is radio frequency. <coughs> and that kind of frequency is no longer seen by the heart. It's just too much for it to see. All it does is it becomes a conducting medium for the electricity. And when it conducts from a tiny tip to a grounding pad in the back of the patient, the concentration, the current density is so high, it initially offers some resistance for the flow of the current. And that's called ohmic resistance. And that resistance heats up the tissue. And once it increases beyond 50 degrees, that area is irreparably damaged forever. 
and that now the abnormally behaving cell is gone for good unless otherwise the person gets another cell which starts activating at some other point in the future and if they modify their lifestyle is hopefully they won't get this again and majority of the arrhythmias can be fixed with one uh, ablation one or two ablation methods now you can deliver energy through alternate means you can also freeze the tissue uh, that's called cryoablation what essentially we do is take the temperature down so low like minus 50 degrees celsius or minus 80 degrees celsius centigrade is an alternate may we're all used to fahrenheit but it's a different uh, uh, scientific way of measuring temperatures what happens is the water inside the cell crystallizes and that breaks the cell membrane and then cell actually essentially dies on its own now usually you know if you have to kill a tissue in case of cryoablation they usually say freeze thaw and refreeze again so that for sure the cell is gone and doesn't come back or wake up and give trouble because some it's easier to survive a frostbite than a burn injury so to speak uh, you can use other techniques like laser and now there is a newer technique called electroporation which is coming uh, it is not yet widely available, but is undergoing a lot of evaluation where we basically create a massive voltage difference between the cell. Uh, what the, it does is 1,500 volts per centimeter. If you create that kind of a voltage gradient, all the ion channels in the cell membrane open simultaneously. That leads to a self-destructive ion exchange. So essentially, you're neither heating up the tissue nor cooling up the tissue. You're killing it by itself, by its own mechanisms, by opening up the gateway channel. So there are several ultrasound has been tried, it's, and several me mechanisms are available. But most popular, even today, 80% uh, of ablations are performed utilizing radio frequency and 20% using cryoablation. Okay, so. Um... I know that there's a very high success rate with uh, ablations, particularly at the more expert facilities like Mayo Clinic. Tell me, why do some ablations fail? Yes, the obviously, if it is a focal origin of the arrhythmia and the mapping technique is probably the likely source of failure. For example, the reference catheter moves and then your entire 3000 points give you a different location than the source content of the arrhythmia if the patient wriggles or moves or the annotation of individual points the, the either the physician or the technician or somebody's in a hurry or they're overlooking and then the entire system fails i mean one minor error can lead to a shift in the focal uh, assessment by three to five millimeters. And now, even though it's not a big shift in real life, in terms of ablation, it's a huge shift. So you have to be, the localization has to be pinpoint. Now, the ability to induce a, a, the arrhythmia makes a big role. Supposing you come to the lab and deal with an infrequent arrhythmia, then your success is difficult to assess and the most important thing is to some degree operator in patients um, because you may have gotten the arrhythmia you may be at the precise location you might not have delivered enough energy to get rid of all the cells which are misbehaving what is called a full thickness burn which means that area is completely destroyed now the general norm in the, throughout the field is to wait for 30 minutes and wait for the swelling from the arrhythmia, the, from the heating has gone and the native burn alone is there. And now reinduce the arrhythmia with the adrenaline to reassess that it is for sure gone for good. And so if you would truncate any of the steps, there is failure. And Fortunately, the, the system gives you some leeway, but 
It also is unforgiving if you're ablating the wrong location because of any other methods or you didn't wait long enough, then the recurrence of the arrhythmia will come back. So the, uh, the field has created several counter check mechanisms uh, to make sure the arrhythmia does not come back. But they are time consuming and patience is a virtue. And when uh, you have limited amount of time allocated to a procedure, uh, then you have to finish by the time. And for example, it may, there may have been some difficulty getting the catheter to the location because the patient had some abnormal system. Then your time is eaten up in all this. Then your actual mapping time and reassessment time and waiting times are all truncated. Then you end up with a second procedure or a third procedure. Okay. Talk about uh, who's a good candidate for an ablation and when is the determination made where a patient might be better off on antiarrhythmic medications or some other mode of therapy versus the ablation? Yeah, the most common arrhythmia we're ablating today, I mean, 80% of my job is on atrial fibrillation ablation. And I would say 15% uh, is on PVC ablation. Very little is on SVT these days. I mean, 20 years ago when I started, we were doing 50% of the time SVT, so the situation has evolved. In atrial fibrillation, generally, there are very good guidelines of when a patient should undergo ablation. First of all, the symptom burden is critical, meaning how often a patient gets episode and how severe each episode is perceived. And supposing a patient who gets a daily episode of atrial fibrillation and each episode makes him feel lightheaded, dizzy, and he has to sit down, then that's a high symptom burden. Contradistinct this to a patient who gets once every two years, then that would be considered a low burden patient. Now there are patients in between the spectrum of patients. So symptoms generally determine. In case of PVCs, people get regular beat, and a very quick beat called a PVC. Then there is a pause because the natural system waits to recover. And that loads the heart with a lot of blood because the heart is not beating. And then when it starts beating again, it pumps a lot more blood than what it would normally pump. That will activate some of the pressure sensors within your carotid arteries, make you feel funny. So. There could be low burden of arrhythmias, but extremely symptom symptomatic. On other cases, people have high frequency, high burden, and then high frequency, low symptoms. I mean, it depends on a judgment call at the end of the day. If a patient can't live their normal life with, uh, with the arrhythmia, then it is time to make a plan to get rid of it one way or another. Now, there could be situations where the arrhythmia burden may be low, but it is producing mechanical abnormalities such as heart function reduction. For the heart function assessment is called left ventricular function. We call that as ejection fraction is what's a term that is commonly used. It is the proportion of the blood that is pumped from its full filling to its full emptying. I mean, it, the heart never rings out 100% of the blood it rings out 60% of its content. And that is considered 100%. So if your ejection fraction is 60%, that's equal to 100% efficiency. Supposing someone has 35,000 PVCs in one 24 hour period, there's a possibility that the pumping ability may drop to 30% or 25% or 35%. And that actually in turn makes the patient feel out of breath and so on, even though the PVC themselves may not be symptomatic. And now we're talking of how long the patient will live with a low pumping ability. So we have to do something. So in these kind of situations, we decide that, okay, we have come to a point where this arrhythmia needs to be gotten rid of. In patients with Wolf Parkinson White, which is an extra connection other than the AV node, they can produce what's called a circus movement tachycardia. The electricity descends through the normal electrical circuit and comes back through this accessory connection like a bypass road back to the upper chamber and goes back through the normal chamber and creating a circus movement tachycardia. So it is fairly obvious in those situations, the heart will be beating 180, 190. They won't feel well. 
we have to find a way of getting rid of this. So once we make the determination that this is causing enough symptoms and we have to get rid of this, we have either medication choices or ablation choices. Majority of the young patients, ablation is a good choice. If you're 85 and above, medication is probably a better choice. Sometimes the physician may say, the better to put a pacemaker and cauterize the AV node completely. So close the pathway from upper chamber to lower chamber, take over the bottom chamber beating with a pacemaker because you're 90 years old, you're not going to go through a three and a half hour procedure with all the risks involved. Uh, on the other hand, a 25 year old, you would never recommend a pacemaker. I mean, unless there's a complication. So their, their decision is based on what is a patient's current status, the symptom burden, what is the left ventricular function. But at the end of the day, there are not good medications. Uh, we have beta blockers, which basically cut the effects of adrenaline on the heart. We have calcium channel blockers, which re prevent the accumulation of calcium within the cell that thereby extra beats are somewhat reduced. Then we have pure antiarrhythmic drugs like flaconide, to Ticus and to amiodrome. Now, each one of them has a set of side effects that we may not be able to use. For example, if somebody has chronic lung disease, we would not choose amiodrome. If somebody has kidney problems, we would not choose Ticusin. If somebody has had a heart attack, we would never use flaconide. So there are restrictions because there's, there are risks of death and complications from the medications. So we have to ba balance the pros and cons of the procedure versus the side effects of the medications and the symptom burden. We take this collectively into a box in our experience mind and make a decision which is palatable to the patient. At the end of the day, patient needs to agree to whatever we're doing. Right. And you touched on age, and that was uh, one of the questions I had planned to ask you today. Is there... Is this something like cardiac arrhythmia is something that affects more the elderly population or is it split down the middle with middle age? Do you see people in their 20s? What's what's a common age category or is it all across the board? It's uh, by and large, it is an elderly person's problem. I mean, forgive my, forgive me for using the term elderly, but... Uh, we don't know what is elderly anymore uh, because I myself is in the late 50s now. It's a diff, uh, you know, 65 and greater was used to be considered because of the Social Security benefits and Medicare benefits. But let us say 75 today is real elderly and, and or more mature part of life. Generally, what is aging is nothing but accumulated errors in the, uh, metabolism over time. And so they will produce abnormalities of cell behavior. The longer we stay on earth, this earth, we will have some abnormalities in the hair grays, the skin wrinkles, the prostate enlarges, and so on. And something will change within the proteins of the body. We've been exposed to the milieu that we are exposed to. In the old days, your young patients had more SVTs and a bulk of the patients who came to the EP lab or electrophysiology lab where young patients with Wolf Parkinson White syndrome were more common among men, or AV node reentry tachycardia, which is instead of one highway, we have two highways of the normal highway. And so the electricity bounces between the two highways, so called AV node reentry, and that is more common in women. And these were the young patients who are coming to the lab. But today, atrial fibrillation ablation is the most common problem. And atrial fibrillation is an age-related problem. Yes, there are young patients who get AFib. Uh, either there is familial or genetic-based, or they have very high blood pressure, or they have congenital heart disease, which was repaired, like ventricular septal defect, atrial septal defect, or a Fontan kind of procedure. Then they can lead to arrhythmias. But by and large, those are very, very few patients. The bulk of the patients are either age or high blood pressure related atrial fibrillation. And most of the patients who undergo ablation are between 65 to 80. I have done a one or two ablations for people older than 85 in AFib where 
super athletic at 87 years of age. I did one patient who was that old. Uh, I have done probably about 30 patients older than 80 years for AFib. Uh, majority of the patients I do are between 65 to 80. There are patients whom I've done in the age of 30, but they are very few again. So you can see bulk of the ablations are today are in atrial fibrillation or around atrial fibrillation or its consequences. And bulk of the uh, patients are between 60 to 80 years of age. Okay. So the, you told me that, you know, at one time, years ago, there was more of a split with, uh, you know, SVT, the lower ventricular arrhythmias, and the atrial-related uh, arrhythmias, which are in the upper chamber. Why do you think that shift has occurred, that you see less of the lower ventricular arrhythmias today and more prevalence of the atrial-induced arrhythmias? Okay. Sorry, SVT is also atrial, okay. so supraventricular. Me, so okay. you, you mean ventricular arrhythmias are purely yes. from the bottom yes. chamber. Thank uh, you for that so clarification. In terms, sure. sure. So the, the SVTs nowadays are addressed by pediatric electrophysiologists. So they, uh, in the past, there was no such specialty called pediatric electrophysiology. So people have to have their arrhythmia as a child given medications, even amiodarone in the old days. Uh, and then they have to become 16 or 18 adult size before we could do. Uh, but today, there are people who do these arrhythmia ablations at a very young age. I mean, like three and five wow. and seven. I mean, they, so they, anybody with any of these Wolf Parkinson White syndrome, which used to be the common arrhythmia ablation, that is now taken care of by pediatric electrophysiologists. So very rare for somebody to escape through the net to become an adult and start having symptoms. Uh, so we are going to have some symptoms as we get older. One of the reasons why our PVC referrals are increasing is because I, I strongly believe, although there's some studies to back it up, this hormone replacement therapy um, was definitely reducing the PVC burden. But because of the breast cancer risk and the cardiovascular disease and thromboembolic risk, uh, like heart attack and pulmonary embolism and so on, hormone replacement is no longer recommended, especially among women. And so the around 45, 50 years of age, when the estrogen starts dropping, they start developing quite a few extra beats and many of them seek therapy. Bulk of them just require reassurance. Um, this is because of the pulsatile release of HCG because the ovary is no longer responding to the pituitary hormone. And the pulsatile release of these hormones give them a, a rush feeling and some kind of extra beats. And me, bulk of the patients, once you tell them this is physiological, they feel reassured and they get over it. Get over it. A small minority may even require antidepressant therapy, which reduces the pulsatile release. Uh, not because they're depressed, but mainly to reduce this pulse But sometimes they may require medications and an ablation. But you can see the pediatric gateway into adult cardiology has really reduced the need for adult electrophysiologists to deal with SVTs, the circus movement the tachycardias such as WPW and AVNRT are addressed. AVNRT has a bimodal distribution, you know, before menarche, it's very common, but post menopause, it's not in, I mean, because of the estrogen influence on the conduction pathways within the heart. And so we do get patients AV node reentry as SVTs uh, in populations of women between 50 to 80. But again, they're far and few. I mean, uh, it's in bulk of the patients still at atrial fibrillation, but the pediatric electrophysiologists have really siphoned off almost all of the WPWs, which are symptomatic at a young age. Okay. You had mentioned that uh, an excessive PVC burden, such as, you know, 35,000 extra beats per day has a, uh, 
a negative impact on the heart. It can actually lower the efficiency of the heart and lower the ejection fraction of the heart, uh, which is how much blood it's able to efficiently pump out. Uh, my question to you is, once that arrhythmia is remedied, whether it's through ablation or medications, is that burden on the heart reversible? For the vast majority, the answer is yes. 95% of the patients have a good reversal of the heart function. Um, if, for example, you take a patient, I mean, generally 20,000 or greater, 20% of the heartbeats with the reduction of heart function is considered a good indication to do an ablation. There are patients where even if 10,000 PVCs are there, but the heart function is reduced to 35 or 40 percent, we might entertain the idea. Now, almost all of them are reversible. So that is why this new entity called premature ventricular contact, contraction or PVC mediated cardiomyopathy, which is weakening of the heart muscle. Having said that, if the heart starts dilating and you ablate very, very late in the course of the disease, for example, normal left ventricular diameter is between 35 to 54. And you have a patient who is now 78 or 85 millimeters and has a PVC which is 30,000 in burden. Now you have made the ventricle go so floppy over so long. Then you ablate the PVC and eliminate it. The ejection fraction might not improve or improve only by five percentage points and doesn't go back to being normal. Now, then it becomes a difficult question. Did the PVC cause the cardiomyopathy or the cardiomyopathy resulted in the PVC? So it becomes a, a bigger problem. In very dilated ventricles, sometimes we might do what's called an MRI of the heart. MRI is magnetic resonance imaging. And we give a specific substance called gadolinium to see whether there is scar tissue. And if there is excessive scarring of the heart from prolonged weakening of the heart muscle, then we might tell even in advance to the patient, the likelihood of complete reversal is very low. But usually the, the easiest way to assess this is to, I mean, we can be doing MRI in every patient who come, comes with a PVC. So what we do is we look at the echocardiogram or ultrasound of the heart we look at the PVC beat, and the next beat, which is loaded with a lot more blood, has got a larger end diastolic volume, which means full filling capacity. And when it pumps, it'll pump more vigorously. And if you have good vigorous contraction on higher filling, then we know that the heart is going to come back if you can eliminate the PVC. So that's a very quick indication. So we look for post-PVC contraction, how well it contracts, and the left ventricle and diastolic diameter as an indicator of how well the heart function would come back at the end of the procedure, assuming we're successfully able to eliminate the PVC. We talk a lot about prevention on this podcast. And as far as, uh, you know, arrhythmia, type diseases of the heart. Is there any lifestyle things that we deal with today that you think could be impacting the prevalence of this disease? Um, you know, there's a lot of sodium in the uh, standard American diet, probably too much. Do you think that plays into this? And do you think dietary measures could lessen the impact of this disease or even lower the numbers of it? What, sh what are your thoughts on that? Oh, it's a great question. Majority of the arrhythmias we see is from obesity and hypertension. And clearly, we are getting far more uh, uh, calories than we can ever spend. Uh, an average American diet today is between 2,500 to 3,000. And that's a lot of uh, calories to spend. And it is impossible to spend your energy by exercising. Because for example, a tiny bit of cheesecake will give you 500 kilocalories to spend that you had to walk four miles. I mean, you can't 
keep spending the energy. So most important thing is to not to challenge ourselves with too much uh, too much carbohydrate that you can't spend. Salt is a big 1.5 grams of sodium or 3 grams of sodium chloride, which is the salt. And anytime the f meal tastes salty, we are in trouble. That means we part of the problem is where the modern American life and in general, the globally, we're living in air conditioning where sweating is not a way of getting rid of the salt. So you, if you're in the tropics, for example, you can sweat four to six grams of salt and you can eat eight grams of salt and get away with it. But if you're in air conditioned atmosphere with no sweating throughout the day, then it is very difficult to get rid of the salt. The, the uh, other major lifestyle modification, which I want to tell to your younger audience and as well as for majority is alcohol. Um, I, I think as a society, um, Major, most of us enjoy a glass of wine or so with dinner or at least on Fridays and Saturdays. And a glass becomes two and then three and many people have cocktails. And it all depends on how rapidly the alcohol is consumed. And sometimes I go to bars and look at people who gulp the entire shot. And I know his serum alcohol level is just going to go through the roof. And that is noticed by the heart. The alcohol, say you take a glass of wine and consume it over 45 minutes, your serum alcohol level never goes beyond 0.6 and the heart will never see it. <laughs> but on the other hand, you take a shot, you go to 2.2 or 0.22, then the heart is going to see it. And eventually either you get arrhythmias or you get cardiomyopathy or something. So. I, to be honest with you, the French lifestyle of having a little cheese before wine is an excellent idea because the it shuts down the gastroesophageal sphincter because if you drink liquid like alcohol, wine, or whatever cocktail, it runs through the stomach into the intestines to be absorbed. You take a little cheese bar, which is so difficult to digest compared to a liquid, the sphincter shuts down, it churns the cheese for hours and does it only squirts the alcohol into the intestines, doesn't entirely allow the entire, your stomach will become your glass holder basically. Uh, it, it holds the alcohol and doesn't let it go into the system very quickly. So I think, first of all, I'm not against drinking alcohol. I myself enjoy it on weekends and drink it slowly take your time, enjoy the conversation, have some cheese in advance or something in the stomach so the sphincter doesn't open completely to release the contents into the intestine. But lifestyle is a combination of carbohydrate excess, which we have to moderate. Make sure salt, especially French fries and so on, where they sprinkle salt. If you seem to go to one of the fast food restaurants, they bulk fry it and throw a bunch of salt over it. I mean, you got to be careful about the amount of salt intake. You have to be moderate on alcohol and you have to find a way to inc incorporate some exercise in your daily routine. And you don't need to be a marathon runner to be to have a good heart health. All you need is a 10 minute of warming period, 20 minutes you have to maintain at the exercise and then 10 minute of cooling period, which is 30, 40 minutes. What is a good exercise at the 20 minute is 220 minus your age. For example, if you're 50 years old, it's 170 times 0.85, so about 155 beats that you have to maintain for 20 minutes. So if you're 70 years old, it becomes 150 times 0.85, which is 135 beats for 20 minutes. So warm up, maintain that 85% of your 220 minus age and cool down for 10 minutes, 40 minutes. That's all you need in terms of longevity you are not going to achieve any additional longevity by extreme exercise. But you will, to look good, you have to do extreme exercise and, you know, lift weights and so on. But for in terms of cardiovascular health and longevity, that's all you need. So healthy lifestyle, which includes both diet and exercise and everything in moderation is a key for ultimately not only preventing coronary artery disease, but even for prevention of arrhythmias. Uh, it's a, it's, I, it's, uh, I want to emphasize 
that alcohol is becoming a problem in a lot of very accomplished and well-balanced members of the society because I think especially in this pandemic, there's nothing many can do. They sit in front of Netflix or whatever program that they choose and they enjoy uh, one too many drinks that they don't even know that they're drinking. And so then then popcorn with a lot of salt and butter and then it just adds up. So I think this is these are the issues that we deal with as a physician. It's a lot of counseling involved. Many times I spend half the visit on counseling of how to lead a healthy life, which is which is a challenge, I agree. But we mind is highly trainable. We can do a lot of things with our mind. You brought up exercise, and I want to ask a cardiologist this question um, to get a, a real professional take on this. But what is the importance and significance of the warm up and cool down phase in exercise? Why is that emphasized? So this question uh, pertains to whether uh, what is the benefit of this warm up and uh, cool down in terms of exercise. I mean, the first thing is the the tendons can easily rupture because when you are weighing, say, let us say for calculation purpose, hundred kilos, and you're moving at five miles per hour, which you're putting over five hundred kilos or. Uh, of force on your Achilles or other tendons which are propelling you at that speed. Now they're not really, the blood supply hasn't increased and you haven't, the temperature of those tendons has not gone up. By stretching, you increase the temperature a little bit and their elasticity, and then you gradually amp up. The probability of rupture is much lower, especially if you get out of a cold bed or the ambient temperature, say, let us say in Phoenix today is 58 degrees in the morning. And the body is phasing, uh, I mean, of course, it will never go down to 58 degrees. It will still maintain it around 98, 96. But it needs to warm up for it to, not, to resume its elasticity. So that is the mechanical advantage of warm up. Now, in terms of cardiovascular health, the moment you start moving, the cardiac output increases. But the blood vessels would have to relax to let all that blood come in. Otherwise, your blood pressure raises. So in the in, as soon as you start the exercise, the blood pressure will go up a little bit. And it will sequentially go up as you continue to exercise. But then it, at some point, the blood pressure will not start rising. So if you warm up and gradually amp up, the challenge to the cardiovascular, because it is at rest and now you're suddenly moving, and that change is slow, a ramp up is very slow, the heart and the blood vessels adapt. Instead, you start straight away running at 10 miles per hour. The blood pressure goes through and the heart has to adjust and adapt to pump against that high resistance then you're likely to encounter some cardiovascular issues or you'll immediately get tired out, adrenaline will release. And then what will happen is you may not be able to exercise at all. And you will say, I'm just too tired, I can't do it. So I think either there could be events that occur in the challenging initial phase, or there could be uh, significant cardiovascular issues that can arise, plus the tendon rupture issues and so on. That's why we believe strongly a warm-up period is essential. Now, the cooling down is to make sure that you don't want to peak exercise abruptly stop because the heart is beating at a much higher rate and the blood pressure is elevated. We want that to come down gradually. Recover Recovery can be quick, although we prefer 10 minutes because then it gives you 40 minutes of mobilization totally. I mean, this is a 24-hour period, so we're talking only a 40 minutes. You, generally, most people are awake for 16 hours, so it is easy to dedicate 40 minutes or so for oneself. Uh, that would be very helpful. So, Dr. Sri, you mentioned um, counseling patients on on dietary strategies and and nutrition and sort of preventative strategies to not allow cardiovascular disease to worsen or conditions to worsen. 
How hard is it to get patients to follow that lifestyle changes and modifications that you recommend to them? Yeah, it's uh, interesting. A third of them take it to heart and absolutely change their lifestyle. Uh, a third modify a little bit, and the third are impervious to suggestions, and they feel, I have a problem. You're, you, why don't you fix the problem? Kind of. I mean that. I mean, I agree. That's how most people approach. Some people approach it, but luckily, uh, we have a good group of, uh, you know, both physicians, nurse practitioners, allied health, who we'll work with them as a group. And I have to say, majority of the population is very, very reasonable, and they would be very compliant with uh, our recommendation. On the dietary front, one additional thing as we do as arrhythmia consultants is to incorporate a lot of fish in the diet. Uh, in fact, we routinely recommend patients to take at least salmon twice a week. Uh, it seems to have some kind of antiarrhythmic property. Now, although not well defined, uh, precise mechanisms and so on, the uh, fish oil studies and meta-analyses have been somewhat wishy-washy, but overall, though, uh, subjectively, patients have been complaining significant improvement in their symptoms when they consume a lot more fish-based diet. But I have to say two-thirds of the population of the patients we see are fairly compliant, uh, if not to 100% to a large degree. But even the remaining third, only a small proportion, really don't want to uh, adhere to any diet at all. But majority do comply with every, all of the requests that we ask. Hmm. And you work at Mayo Clinic. Tell me about the culture of Mayo Clinic. It's a very innovative hospital. Um, it's a well-known institution around the world. It's got a very collaborative approach to treatment. A lot of departments communicate together. I've walked the halls of Mayo. I mean, I, I was just fascinated to to see rows of classrooms with physicians actively learning, you know, as, as the day is going. What's it like to work in that environment? Oh, it's a very stimulating environment. You know, first of all, uh, the entry is very carefully assessed for the physicians to join Mayo Clinic. They, first of all, we're all on salary. We're, uh, you know, so there is no internal competition between I see more patients or you see more, or I want to do more procedures. So, yeah, although, I mean, it is, uh, it's made much more uh, honor-based system where collegiality matters a lot more. And also the patient comes first. Now, I may have a patient whose procedure might take four or five hours because I can either not localize the arrhythmia or uh, I have to observe the pattern and, and make sure the waiting period and so on. And my colleague in the other room might be doing five cases in the meantime. So there's really no pressure in terms of internal competition. But on the other hand, we also expect absolute quality metrics. What are your outcomes? What are your complications? They're measured. If you have complications, why did it occur? And what could you have done to prevent this? And, and every little detail is analyzed. And because we are not overburdened with the clinical cases and we have we provided ample time to educate ourselves, pontificate, think, and what is the best thing that we can do? And when you are with a patient, don't feel rushed. And those kind of things create a milieu of excellence. And of course, uh, because the group of people who got selected are interested in research, science, and publication, and they all tend to publish. And when you publish, you end up meeting a group of people who publish and bounce off ideas and innovation. You know, Mayo has a huge uh, patent library and a lot of innovations occur. And there's a huge uh, degree of cardiac innovations that are being, uh, you know, patented and sometimes licensed to outside agencies to market them as products. 
And so essentially you work in an environment uh, where you're, you're generally very well taken care of. You're given a very good uh, work-life balance while constantly promoting your scholarly activity and innovation and patient care. I think all of them come together very nicely uh, within Mayo Clinic. So the environment is, to me, it is one of the best environments in healthcare system that I have seen. Now, I moved from England, uh, which is a different system, a public health system. And I, uh, I don't know whether Mayo Clinic is replicatable everywhere, but it is a very unique system, and I'm really uh, honored and privileged to be there. I'm, a, I'm, to a large extent, I'm lucky to be there. Well, you're doing fantastic work, and uh, I commend you for for all that you're doing. And as I've said before, um, I've spoken to a number of your peers, and uh, I've only heard amazing things. So keep doing the, the great work that you're doing. And uh, Dr. Commander Srivatsan, I want to thank you for joining us today. And uh, it's been a pleasure to have you on. It's my pleasure. And thanks, thanks again for having me. And that will do it for this edition of the Natural Man Podcast. Remember to check us out on Instagram. We're at Natural Man Podcast on there and keep up to date with us. And my name is Mike C. Until next time, stay healthy. This has been the Natural Man Podcast. Subscribe to our podcast for more episodes. The information contained in this podcast is for informational and educational purposes only and is not intended to be a substitute for medical advice of any kind or to diagnose and or treat any disease. Please consult a physician for personal medical advice. Always consult a physician or other qualified healthcare provider with any questions regarding a medical condition. Never substitute, disregard, or delay seeking professional medical advice or treatment because of something you've heard on the Natural Man Podcast.